you say a word to every heart in life? Yes, yes. You've never been here before? Only met Brother Bill the one time many years ago. And I know he has left a great deposit of truth in the hearts of many lives. Amen. So it's a privilege to be here and hope that even tonight there will be a ministration of truth that will do an eternal work in the hearts of his people. I want to read a few verses from uh, John chapter 5. After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, some translated sheep gate, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. The next verse is left out in many, many versions. Uh, it's also left out in Ivan Pannon's version, which is a numerical uh, structure, a numerical uh, Bible that he spent 50 years discovering the numerical structure of the Scripture. And, but probably it was uh, something that was of current belief that there was an angel that troubled the waters. However, I'm not... I don't come here to argue that point. For an angel, they were waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, coming another steppeth down before me. Before me. Jesus says unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. I won't read any more right now, but we may a little later. I felt to touch on this episode, one of the great miracles of Jesus' ministry, because I believe there's a lot of things there that the Lord would have us understand. First, of course, the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, came into the world to reveal the Father. Not only to make known his character, but to be the very word of the Father in the flesh. The word of the Father made flesh and dwell among us. So I hesitate to use the expression God the Son in distinction to God the Father. Uh, in the first place, it's not a biblical uh, phrase. But rather, the Son of God, the Father, was the word of the Father in the flesh. He was the expression of the Father in the flesh. Amen. So he came to reveal the Father in flesh. Yes. Yes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And then John, John goes on to say, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh. Uh, Let's just ponder that a little. Uh, Paul says, writing to the Hebrews, God who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by a son, literally in a son. And what he's bringing out is this, not that Isaiah spoke and Jeremiah spoke and Ezekiel spoke and now the Son of God is speaking. That's not the thought he's bringing out, but the God who revealed himself in many ways, in prophets, in dreams and revelations, so forth, 
his final revelation, now at the end of these days, he has spoken unto us in his son. In other words, the son was that uh, ultimate revelation. He spoke in part in times past in various ways through the prophets in divers manners, but now uh, God's final revelation is the son himself. Because he was the word made flesh. So that all that was in the heart of the Father, God was pleased in sending his Son to take up his habitation in the Son. The Son being the, the very unveiling of the heart and mind of the Father. For is that not what your word is? You speak it, it's something in your heart and mind, and feebly perhaps, or with eloquence, in some way, you try to express the thought of your heart and mind. And so that's what Paul was saying, that the, the Word was, became flesh, flesh like you and I have, in a manner that God could relate himself to mankind. Not just speaking precisely in Hebrew or Greek as the prophets did in the Old Testament, but now in his very being in the expression of the Father. Uh, but uh, in incarnation, he came to die. We know that. But there are far greater implications to the incarnation than the fact that he came to be our Redeemer. He came to die. He came to redeem us. He came to do away with the sin that alienated us from God. And that's only half the story. That's only half the gospel message. He came to do all that. But then, having done that, the way was open for him to join us unto himself. So he came in our flesh. His ultimate purpose being to join us unto himself. Having been redeemed, to be joined unto himself. But it must be a union with him that is divine and not mechanical or, or not partial, not falling short of God's intention because God wanted a family like him. So he was said to be the firstborn among many brethren because God had a plan for his many brethren to conform them to the same image as the only begotten. Conform us to the same image. We like to emphasize that and every time I do I like to emphasize the fact it doesn't mean that we're to be as great as he is great. To be as exalted as he is exalted. For as the unique Son of God, He will always have the preeminence in all things. He will always have that first place. In all things, Christ must have the preeminence. So we never deny that. But we're talking about nature and character. And He wants us to be like Him. That's His plan. That's, that's why He came. That's why He died. To buy us back, to redeem us, about... There's a greater mystery to redemption that the Apostle Paul was given great insight concerning it. He not only died to redeem us, but in his death he became a planting. He became a planting in the earth that out from that planting there would come forth fruit, good fruit, fruit like the seed that was planted. And so when we recognize that it helps us to understand the mystery without getting too theological about it. Because the thought comes, we're be like him, never like him, because he's too great and mighty. He's totally without sin. We can't be without sin. And, and all kinds of arguments. But when you see that it's God's working, it's not a case of you and I striving to be like Jesus. It's a case of we being that soil in which the seed of Christ was planted. That out from the honest and good heart, that's how Jesus describes the good soil, he that is of an honest heart, that's the good soil, he plants the seed of life, and out from that comes fruit like the seed that was planted. So if we don't try to water that down or minimize the implications of it, if he's the true seed and he's planted in good soil, he'll bring forth after his kind. 
That's the truth of Genesis. That in everything that God planted, he, in the fruit there is seed that bringeth forth after its kind. So we understand it in nature and we have no problem with it. We don't even bother trying to figure out the, how it could happen. How you can take a grain of wheat and plant it in the soil. And if that seed is good and alive and given the right conditions of moisture and sunshine, it will bring forth seed like the seed that was planted. Of course, all the church, I think, believes someday we get to heaven, all this will happen. And I like to remind people of Romans 5, where Paul speaks about two kingdoms. Two kingdoms and two men. Two kingdoms, the head of which there were two men. Adam, the head of the old kingdom. The last Adam, the head of the new kingdom. And just, we won't go into it in detail, but it's so clear. In fact, Paul uses the expression much more in Romans 5. He uses it five times to emphasize that if this is the way it was because we're in the old Adam, then this is the way, this is God's intention because we're in the last Adam. But nevertheless, there's a parallel. Through Adam came sin and the curse. Through the new man, through the last Adam, came righteousness and life. Through the first Adam started a kingdom which is called the kingdom of sin and death. The reign of sin and death. The law of sin and death started by Adam. And in the last Adam he started another kingdom called the kingdom of life. The kingdom of righteousness. And so there's a parallel but totally opposite. Uh, but how can we miss the clear teaching of the apostle when he says it's evident that we bear the image of the earthly if we're born into his race. He sinned, we sinned. He fell under the curse, we fall under the curse. He started a kingdom of sin and death. We're swept away in that kingdom. The kingdom of sin and death. Why? Not because we die and go down to the grave. Not when you die and go to the grave, but now the kingdom of sin and death is working. And, but there's another kingdom, the kingdom of life, the kingdom of righteousness. And Paul parallels them. He says, much more. If through sin and di disobedience came the reign of sin and death, much more shall they that receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life by Christ Jesus. Much more, much more, much more. Yet somehow, we can't believe that. We have no problem believing that Man, because he's born a sinner, grows up a sinner, practices sin, and can't do anything else but sin because he's born in Adam. He doesn't have any problem with that. But if a man's born in Christ, we hesitate to believe that somehow God's purpose is that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is so powerful that it can make us free from the law of sin and death which we inherited from Adam. In fact, there's much more reason for us to believe that. Much more, much more. Otherwise, are you going to tell me that we've always got to sin because we inherited the law of sin and death from Adam, uh, but we can never come to the place where we always live righteously because of the strength of the law of sin and death which we inherited from Adam. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will never come to the place where it will overpower the other because the law of sin and death is more powerful than the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You're saying, if you believe that, you're saying that Adam's act of disobedience in partaking of the forbidden fruit is more powerful in its working than the act of righteousness which Jesus performed when he hung on the cross and became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You're saying that Adam's sin is more powerful than the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You know, that's totally unthinkable. Then why don't we believe that? Why don't we believe that it's easier to live righteously than it is to sin? 
because we don't find it operating that way. Because we're still much in the realm of the old Adam. But as surely as God has seen fit to put the law of sin and death in the human family as a result of man's disobedience, so surely has he set in motion the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus to put in the family of God. And that kingdom is going to reign in life by Christ Jesus. It's going to come to a place where it's going to be recognized as king of our lives. The law of life, the kingdom of life, must have greater preeminence than the law of sin and death. But we don't see it. And so because we don't see it, it's hard for us to believe it. But God calls us the things which are not as though they were. God didn't hesitate to change Abram's name to Abraham even before he was Abraham. Even before he was a father of many nations. He says, I don't call you Abram anymore, but from now on your name is Abraham. For a father of many nations, I have made thee. Because God calls the things which are not as though they were. But you say, yes, I know it'll be that way when we get to heaven. But did Adam become a sinner? And did he develop into a sinful nature after he died or well, he, after he had sinned? Did he die and go to hell to enter into that kind of a life? Did we die and go to heaven? In other words, and this is something that's staggering. Are you saying that the sin of Adam is more potent than the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Or are you saying that when we die and go to heaven, by the death which we inherited from Adam we'll enter into the glory of that righteousness when we die. When we submit to the curse that Adam brought upon us, then we'll partake of that righteousness of Christ in a real and living way. We're simply saying that God has made provision by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus to make us free from that old law of sin and death. The fact we haven't appropriated doesn't change anything. The fact that we die believing it doesn't change anything. If we die believing the truth that God has said, it doesn't mean that anything has changed concerning the truth. It simply means that those who die believing it, for them there remaineth a better resurrection. Now I just went into that a little to lay the groundwork for what we had to say uh, regarding what God has in mind for his people and that he will not have finished the, his work at the throne until he has accomplished that which he has in mind for his people he finished his work on earth when he died on the cross when he declared it is finished he totally finished the work of redemption but when he left this earth, he went to heaven to become involved in a ministry in the heavens. That's something that I never realized as a child. Something that isn't emphasized much in the church. That when Jesus went to heaven, he became involved in a heavenly ministry. Paul says he's the minister of the heavenly sanctuary. And Luke, when he begins writing what has become known as the book of Acts. He says, The former things have I written, O Theophilus, concerning the things which Jesus began both to do and to teach until the time that he was taken up. He clearly implies that what Jesus did on earth was a beginning. The things that Jesus began to do until he was taken up, when he went on to complete the work, he finished the earthly work, but he went to the heavenly sanctuary to become involved in a heavenly ministry. A high priest after the order of Melchizedek. A high priest who liveth forever. He went there that at the throne room he might minister to his church in the earth. Everything that's required to fulfill the new covenant in his people in the earth. To complete 
the fulfillment of the new covenant. He went to the heavens to do that. Because the disciples didn't understand that. They were totally devastated. When our Lord went to the cross and died, they were totally devastated because they were so sure that they knew exactly why he came to earth. He set up a kingdom over which he would rule and reign in the earth, not realizing that the real enemies that God wanted to deal with were not really those enemies on earth, not really the Roman Empire, not really Babylon, not really the nations in the earth. They were not the real enemies. The real enemies were something far greater, sin, death, and everything that proceeds from the realm of Satan and his principalities and powers. Those were the enemies that Christ came to defeat. And therefore, when he rose from the dead, God gave him authority over all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named in earth or in heaven. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that faileth all in all. Ruling and reigning at God's right hand until he has subdued all enemies under his feet because of his great heavenly ministry. The Father says, rule at my right hand until all enemies are subdued under your feet. Perhaps early church thought that should have happened in their lifetime. Perhaps others, as the church age progressed, thought it would happen in their lifetime. For God seems to have kept that sense of the imminence of Christ's return present in every generation. I thought when I was young it had to happen before I grew old. And so now we feel that the end time is near and God will complete the work in our generation. We can't say for sure. But the indication seems to be that we're very near the end. God has always kept that sense of imminence close to the heart of his people who are walking with him. Because even though he may not come physically in the sense in which we know this age will end, when the heavens will be rent asunder and the Son of Man will descend with power and great glory, yet there is a coming of Christ to his people at any time in the church age that God sees fit. And so let's bear that in mind. Don't think your faith is vain if you say, I believe I'll live to see the Lord and then die without seeing him. God wants to reveal himself to his church. And I believe that he's going to reveal himself to the church, the living Christ, I mean. Not just a dream, not just a vision from afar, but the living Christ that many, many of his people will see the Lord even before he returns in power and great glory. The Apostle Paul saw him in a way that was just as real as the revelation he gave to Peter, James, and John, and Jude, and all the other apostles. And when Paul was trying to vindicate his apostleship before the Corinthians because they were rejecting him and putting him in a par below the others, Paul wasn't concerned about that. But he said, I want you to know, Peter saw the Lord in resurrection life, I know, and James saw him, the, old, the other apostles saw him, and he says, I saw him. How many years after the erection and the ascension, I don't know. But he says, I saw him, Peter saw him, James saw him, and I saw the Lord. That wasn't at his first coming, it wasn't at his second coming, but he saw the Lord. So let's always keep that thought in mind, and let's always long to see the Lord Jesus. As I anticipate, even before he comes in power and great glory, he's going to come and visit his people and make himself known. And we're going to see the Lord, the glorified Lord Jesus, walking in the midst of his church before he comes back in that bodily form in which he went away. He stayed here 40 days before he went away. Couldn't he have stayed 400 days? Couldn't he have stayed 1,000 years? 2,000 years? He could have been here in the earth. He, if that was God's plan. Visiting his people. Visiting his people in a very real way. And I, I'm sure the churches would all have their application in to the... whoever was responsible to attend to the, the schedule of Jesus. Please let him come to our church. 
sometime. Please let him come this year. And, and so some of our noted apostles and prophets perhaps have those schedules that are two years in advance that somehow this church and that church might be privileged to have a visitation from this great one. But Jesus said, God's got a better plan. I could stay here, sure, and I could visit a church here in there for the next 2,000 years, but it is expedient for you that I go away. Because if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, of judgment. He was saying, he will be in my place in the earth. He'll be in my stead. When I was here, I reproved the world of sin. When I was here, I showed the world what righteousness was. When I was here, I declared the judgments of God. But when he has come, he'll do all of that. It goes on to say, he will not speak from himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. What could be more blessed than the, for the Holy Spirit to abide in his people? That wherever his people are in the face of the earth, the living Christ could be present in our midst, teaching, unfolding, revealing the heart of the Father. And that's our heritage. And you know very well that we have miserably failed in appropriating that portion of our inheritance. And we think it to be normal. It's become, we've become so used to it, we consider it to be normal. And God's plan was that when our Lord Jesus went away, the very same spirit of the same Jesus would come back in the spirit and take up his habitation in our midst. Yes. That wherever his people gather in his name, there the Lord Jesus would be in their midst. Yes. Jesus said, there am I in the midst of you where two or three are gathered in my name. And he meant it in a vital way, not just a, some kind of mystery. He goes on to say, For if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. He said, Well, I think we'd be satisfied with small gatherings if Jesus was really there in that sense. He's not talking about how small the gathering is or how great. He's simply saying, where two are gathered and agreeing in the Spirit, that one with him is he is one with the Father, that Jesus is there in, in the midst of those two or those three or those three hundred to reveal the living Christ. The Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is there to reveal the Christ, to make him known. So Jesus said, it's better that I go away. Can you and I say, yes, Lord, I, I'm glad you've gone because think of the wonderful things that are going on in the church. I look around and I say, Lord, why didn't you stay? Jesus is better. And this generation is going to yet see and know that it has been good that Jesus went to the Father because he's going to come to glorify himself in a body in the earth, that that body in the earth will be the visible expression of the Lord Jesus in the earth. I found courage to believe as I read the New Covenant and I see so many things there that I know are not actually being experienced in the church. I've got courage to believe. It's there. It's written. It's part of the New Covenant. And Jesus is the mediator of the New Covenant. And he will not fail or be discouraged until he has set righteousness in the earth. It's his ministration in the heavens to do that. Because he sent the Holy Spirit to abide in us that he might take from Christ and reveal it here in the earth. He says, I've got many things to tell you, but you cannot receive it now. But when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will lead you into all truth. You say, we got all truth in the Bible. I know but God said he's going to lead his people into all truth. Nobody would have the... What should I say? No one would stand up and say, all the church of Jesus Christ throughout the earth is walking in all truth. We see a church split asunder by heresies and divisions and strife, strife of one kind and another, rent asunder. 
walking in a lot of uncleanness and bondages. And the minister in the heavenly sanctuary is praying for his people. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. And he has told us he's going to lead his people into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. Better he will not speak out from himself. It doesn't matter that if the whole, it doesn't mean that if the Holy Spirit is speaking, he will never mention the term Holy Spirit. He's saying he will not speak out from himself because just as Jesus walked on earth in total union with the Heavenly Father, speaking only from the heart of the Father, doing only the works that the Father gave him to do, moving in total coordination with the heart of God the Father and everything that he did and everything he spoke. So he has gone to heaven and has sent forth the Spirit in our lives that that Spirit will hear what the Son is saying at the throne room and will take all that's in the heart of the Lord Jesus and make it known in the midst of his people. He hasn't finished it yet. He hasn't finished that work yet. He's going to finish it. And we're going to hear the cry in heaven as we heard it from the cross. At the time of the set of trumpets, it's going to be said, It is finished. The mystery of God is going to be finished. It's not finished yet. The mystery of God is still being revealed. It's still being unfolded. It's still being ministered from heavenly places. Paul the Apostle said God gave him the stewardship of these mysteries. Made him to be a steward of the mysteries of God. A steward is one to whom is given the responsibility of uh, handling the affairs of a king or some great potentate, some rich man. He's got other things to do. There's much that he has to take care of. But he puts a dispensation or a stewardship upon a trusted servant and says, I give you this stewardship to dispense the mysteries of God. And Paul says he was a steward of God's mysteries, God's secrets. God had entrusted him with that tremendous revelation of the exalted Christ. He entrusted him with the responsibility of revealing God's secrets to God's people. He initiates us into the secrets of God. Those who have ears to hear, those who want to hear, those who desire to know God's secrets, whose hearts are opened, they receive these divine secrets. You say there's nothing secret about it, it's all there in the Bible. Everything in the Bible is a secret unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to you and I. Everything. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But the Spirit of God in the hearts of God's people searches out those hidden things in God. I hasn't seen what God has yet to do in his church in the earth. Ear hasn't heard, hasn't entered into a heart the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But unto us, God has revealed it by his Spirit, Paul said. For the Spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the depths of God. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I know to give gifts of the Spirit to His church. But if we could only understand that in giving of the gifts of the Spirit to His people, that's a means to an end. It's not the end. It's like rain from heaven. It's God's precious anointing, like rain from heaven. That the rain might do something else. The rain is not the ultimate. The rain is God's provision to open up the seed, cause it to grow, cause it to flourish. That that seed, that good seed that's been planted in the hearts of his people might come forth. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in heaven. No, the full corn in the ear, which is going in the earth. First the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. And the husbandman is waiting for that. He will not reap the harvest until the full ear has come forth. The full corn in the ear. And the time is drawing nigh. People say, oh, you're trying to delay the coming of the Lord. I, I couldn't begin to delay the coming of the Lord. It's all in the Father's hands. But the Father says, I'm waiting for precious fruit. And I've long patience for it till it received the early and the latter rain. He's waiting for that. And therefore, he's going to have it. He, 
his heart will be satisfied and he will not disappoint his son by giving him an inferior reward for his great work of redemption. He will not be disappointed when Christ receives that precious fruit, when Christ receives that glorious church, when Christ receives that holy bride that the Father is preparing for the Son. The Son will rejoice and he will say, Father, you couldn't have given me anything better in earth or in heaven because this bride is going to be totally compatible with Jesus. One so beloved of him that the Son will have total delight in this bride. Therefore, God's passion is to see the righteousness of his people shine forth in the earth. God has a passion to see that righteousness revealed. He says, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof goes forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Because that's God's burden, he puts that burden on his people. I have set watchmen on thy walls, he declares right after declaring his burden. He said, I've set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day and night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence and give him no rest to be established until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Why? Because it's for his glory. God's love gifted Jesus. God's reward to Jesus for the sufferings of the cross. And it's going to be a reward that's going to so bless the heart of Jesus that he will say, Father, I couldn't, you couldn't have given me anything better than this church, this harvest, conformed to my image and likeness by your precious blood and by the working of your spirit in their lives. God has made every provision to bring forth in the earth a people in the image of Jesus. And he's going to have that kind of a people for the honor and glory of his great name. Not a case of stealing glory from Jesus. That's the only way he's going to be glorified. It's when he puts his glory upon his people and they give it back to him. That's the way God is glorified. That's why when they condemned Jesus for making himself equal with God, they totally denied it. He says, making me equal with God, the Son can do nothing of himself. My Father is greater than I. I can't do anything of myself. He came to that place of utter helplessness that as one utterly helpless God might get all the glory that's why God is bringing up people to utter helplessness and to nothing that God might get all the glory Paul says you see your calling brethren not many wise men after the flesh not many mighty not many noble are called but God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. He's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound those that are wise. He's chosen the base things of the world, the things that are despised. And he goes further, yea, the things that are nothing, that he might bring to nothing the things that are. You say, it's easy for us maybe to come to nothing, but Jesus, Jesus deliberately came to a place of helplessness and weakness because he had, in plan, he had a plan whereby when he ascended through his people whom he left in the earth who are already weak but they don't know it, he'd be able to humble them and bring them down, bring them low to the place where the same spirit that functioned in the lowliness of the Lamb of God might function in his people in the earth. Through them to bring to naught the mighty things that have risen themselves up against the knowledge of God. And so we wonder at Jesus, a compassionate master, walking into this crowded area, filled with a multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water, stepped over cripples to find the man that the Father had pointed out, told him to rise up and walk, and he rose up and walked. 
Why would the compassionate Jesus do that? Why didn't he heal them all like he did on other occasions? Because he was simply doing the will of the Father. He did not come to be a healer. He didn't come to be an evangelist. He didn't come to be a prophet. He didn't come to be a miracle worker. He did all of those things. All those gifts of the Spirit which we know of. All those ministries that we know of. He was the sum total of it all. But he didn't come to magnify any one of those offices. He came to do the will of the Heavenly Father. Can't you imagine would have broken his heart to step over those lame people and go and heal one man and walk away. But doing the will of the Father was more important to Jesus than letting the compassion and mercy of his heart be revealed. For as surely as he did the will of the Father, God would open those springs of love and mercy and compassion. that occasions would come when everybody would be healed. But he was confined and restricted to the will of God. I emphasize this, and I think you think you can see what we're saying. But somehow we get the notion that now that Jesus has ascended to the throne, God sent the Holy Spirit, that we've got something in our hands that we're just ready to run and go with it. Instead of realizing... And Jesus went away that we might have the same spirit functioning in us that functioned in him. And that if he was restricted and confined to the will of the Father, so are his people. But there's no such thing as a mandate given to the church go out and evangelize the world. There's no such thing as a mandate given to the apostle. You're an apostle now, go and establish the churches. You're a prophet now. I've anointed you to be a prophet. Go and travel the world and prophesy. But and if the Son of God, who is all of these things, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, miracle worker, healer, counselor, all of these things, that he walked under the restricting, confining mantle of the Holy Spirit that he might do only the will of the Father, how much more does that apply to you and I? and to every apostle and prophet and teacher in the land. We do not have the right to go forth and teach and prophesy and establish churches except and only as the Holy Spirit gives definite instruction how to do it. Our problem being, of course, that we don't find it as easy to know the will of God as Jesus did. But we fail to realize that that's why God deals patiently with us, teaches us, shows us his ways, that he might have a people in the earth yet, in this day, a people whose ear is tuned to the heart of God and they know what the Father wants. It's possible. It's practical. But we have to learn the hard way as Jesus did. Because good or evil didn't matter. You're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath day. Religion had become so apostate and corrupt. And Jesus came and did many wonderful things on the Sabbath day to reveal to God's people, to you and I, that every day is to be a day in which we do good things for the Lord. Every day is to be our Sabbath under the Lord where we enter into His rest. Peace from our own works as God did from His. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. God, bring us to that place. Bring his ministry to that place. Bring all his people to that place. Because that's his intention. For we can't do anything except what we see him doing. He says, too high a standard. We'd never come to that. It's God's intention. That as he is, so should we be in this world. Jesus, when he ascended, said, It's better for you that I go away because the Holy Spirit will come and abide within you. I've been here. The Spirit of God has been here teaching you. You know that the words that I spoke were true. You know that the words that I did were of God. You know that every word that I said was right, even though many times you were perplexed about it. You didn't understand it. You know I spoke the truth. It's 
better for you that I go away? I want to emphasize that because you know very well that it's not better in the church that Jesus isn't here even though we profess to have the Spirit for the simple reason that the Spirit has come we receive him into our hearts has not been given his lordship in the church of Jesus Christ and therefore he's not able to take everything that's in the heart of Jesus and reveal it to you and us because he has not yet been given that total lordship that he requires for that why do I say that? because he's the spirit he has no human body the only instruments that he has to use are the souls of men that Christ has redeemed. And Jesus was satisfied that when he went away, the Spirit of God would complete the work that he started. Because he was going to the throne room with all power in heaven and earth to do it. Not only that, but God had committed unto him authority over all mankind. He said, Father, you have given the Son power over all flesh that he might give eternal life to those particular ones in the human family that the Father had given to Jesus. He gave him power over all flesh that he might give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. He has that authority. And so he put the Spirit of God in the earth to be his vicar in the earth. The Holy Spirit is the vicar of Christ in the earth. He's here in Christ's stead. He takes to hear what the Son is saying and to reveal it to his church. But he dwells in human flesh like you and I. If he's going to speak, he speaks through our mouths. If he hears, he hears through our ears. If he sees, he sees through our eyes. But it doesn't limit the fact that in spite of those weaknesses that we have to hear and to see and understand and to perceive, in spite of those weaknesses, the Holy Spirit is here to fulfill the mandate laid upon him by the Son of God. I am filled with all the riches of the Father, he says, and mine. All that the Father hath, he has given unto me. Therefore, Jesus said, he shall take of mine and show it unto you. All that the Father has, all the riches of the kingdom of Christ, and we can only faintly imagine some of it. It's at the disposal of the Son. And in God's time, in God's way, Jesus reveals the secret to His Holy Spirit. And he reveals it to those obedient vessels in the earth and they declare it in the earth. And the Word goes forth as a living Word, word from the hearts of His people to make it happen in the earth. Remember that. We're not really ministering the new covenant until there's a living word coming forth by the Spirit from the throne room declaring God's mysteries to His people in the earth. That's the new covenant. The ministration of the Spirit of truth through His anointed servants to His people in the earth. And if that isn't taking place, somehow... There's a blocking. It might be deaf ears. It might be blind eyes. It might be a hard heart. But that word, God, will continue to send forth by His Spirit. And I'm not just saying any Bible scripture that we refer to. That living word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God will continue to send forth a living word. And He's going to refine His vessel and his ministry in the earth to the point where they will speak when they stand to speak they will speak the oracle of God as Peter said that same living word must come forth from the mouths of his messengers that came forth from the lips of Jesus because there's no problem as far as Jesus and the Holy Spirit is concerned the Spirit hears what the Son is saying God must somehow quicken that hearing in his servants that the Holy Spirit who holds within us might have free course to declare. It doesn't matter how feebly he declares it or how weak the word or with what strength it seems to come forth because God is choosing 
weak vessels, foolish vessels, vessels that are despised, vessels that are based in the eyes of men, vessels that have come to nothing in the eyes of men in order to destroy the things that are, the things that are rising up in the earth in opposition to the reign of Christ. The Son can do nothing of himself but what he fears the Father do. For whatsoever he doeth, he also doeth the Son likewise. Jesus said, Greater works than me shall he do because I go to the Father. And much has been made of the fact that the sons of God are going to go forth doing greater works than Jesus did. But let me tell you, before we see those greater works, we're going to see a people humiliated, brought to baseness, brought to nothing, brought to weakness, brought to foolishness, that they might have an ear that's in tune with the Spirit, that they might declare clearly from the throne room those things that are belong to Christ and that he's making known to his church. For the Father loveth the Son and shows him all things that himself doeth and he will show him, the Son, greater works than these that you may marvel. Or you say, there's another thing, greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father. And we fail to realize that the greater works are performed by the Son of God in heaven who became weak and is now exalted with all power and authority in the heavens to dispense everything the Father has given him to the church through the Holy Spirit through vessels that are humbled to the dust becoming weak helpless foolish in the eyes of the world that the power of Christ might envelop them And so it was not enough that Jesus Christ was born into this world to be the Messiah, the great apostle, the great prophet, the great teacher, the great evangelist, the great pastor, the great miracle worker. He was all of that. But he did not fulfill his mandate, the burden that was placed upon him by the Father until he learned obedience by the things that he suffered, learned it so well, that he knew the voice of the Father, obeyed the Father explicitly, did nothing of himself, but only what the Father did through him. The Son of God had to go that route. Now you think you can go to a Bible school and you've got the calling to be a prophet, you go to Bible school and get a few scriptures, a little understanding, and go forth and change the world. God is bringing about in the church of Jesus Christ a devastation a devastation amongst his people. It seems like devastation to bring down the people of God to humility and baseness that they might move under the direction of the Holy Spirit so they will know his voice so clearly that they will do exactly what the Son says no more and no less. For Jesus makes it very clear that if we don't come to that abiding union with him much as we might do, great as it might appear in the eyes of men, if we do not come to that abiding union in Christ as the branch of life and the vine, we are able to do nothing. Apart from me, we can do nothing. So we might look around in the world and have our evaluation of who is doing great things for God and what great things are being done according to our evaluation. And God wants us to know that his evaluation is much different than man's evaluation. For if the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. In the very next verse, for as the rain cometh down from heaven, and the snow and water the earth, that might cause the things that are sown in it to spring forth in mud, so shall my word be that proceedeth out of my mouth it shall not return to me void it shall accomplish that which I please it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it greater works than these will he do the father will show him the son greater works than these that ye may marvel the greater works that our people, his people are going to do 
are these greater works that Jesus spoke about. He said, again, I did one great work and we all marvel about it. But greater works than these they're going to do because I go to the Father. Not because these vessels are greater, but it's far weaker. And they must become yet much more weak than they are, much more foolish, much more base. Before we're going to see these greater works that Jesus has in mind for his church. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus continues to be the minister of the heavenly sanctuary, ministering from the throne of God all that the Father has given him. He hasn't exhausted his supply. Somehow we get the notion that the apostles came and wrote the scriptures and we got it all. I believe that in the scriptures there is the intention of God's heart. But as God unfolds his intention from the scriptures, we're going to see things that Paul spoke about when he said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But unto us God has revealed them by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches present tense. All things gave the depths of God. All through church history, this has been true. The Spirit of God has searched out those depths of God and those vessels whom God has prepared. Perhaps, perhaps usually, too much trial and testing and tribulation. He prepared their hearts so they would, they would have a hearing ear to what the Father was saying. And they heard a word and they declared it. And there it was in the earth and God wouldn't take it back. Some of those vessels, we don't know their names. Some of them, we've heard about them, but nothing much came of it. When Luther read some of John Hutcher's writings, he said, well, that's, that's what God showed me. It was in the earth a hundred years before Luther got it. If God put it in the earth, God says, I won't take it back until it is accomplished the desire of my heart. A hundred years go by and God raised up another man, Luther, and gave him the same revelation. The truth was in the earth and God wouldn't take it back until it accomplished the desire of his heart. In the last 20, 30, 40 years, God has been revealing much to the church of Jesus Christ. The anointed word has gone forth and it has lingered in the hearts of his people. Some said, oh, doesn't amount to much. That revival just blew over quickly, didn't amount to much. And they failed to realize that God would not let uh, that revival of the mid-40s to become a denomination. But perhaps millions of lives were eternally touched by what God did. God wouldn't let it form into a denomination that person could say, oh, it didn't become very great, it sort of faded away. The rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and waters the land and will not return to the Father void. Nor is that word wasted. All the rivers run into the sea. The sea is not full. Because though it runs into the sea, by the process of evaporation it comes back again into the heaven as water vapor. Certain conditions result in God's creative purposes. And that water, water vapor forms into a cloud. We look at that cloud, we say, we believe it's going to rain because we can see a little bit of visible manifestation of the water in the form of a cloud. In the process of time, God causes the thunder and the lightning and it comes down as rain again. God will not take it back until it has accomplished the purpose for which he sends it forth. I've been aware many, many times of the anointing of God as I minister. So have you. have been aware of it. May God feel our hearts, our minds, our lips to the point where we hear his voice so clearly 
that we declare only what the Son is saying in heaven. Because until we come to that kind of confinement to God's will and purposes, we will not be those broken vessels in the earth in whom the Spirit of God can move freely to reveal the hidden manna that God has for his people. We must come to this place not where we say it, to try and cause the people to think we're humble, but because we know it is true that we can do nothing of ourselves as we hear we judge. And our judgment will be just if we seek not our own will, but the will of the Father which sends it. Our judgment, our discernment will be right. When we hear the voice of God clearly, when we know His will clearly, we will say what was right because we'll be under a restriction of the Holy Spirit. Not to give our opinions or our ideas, but to speak from the heart of God. I believe God is preparing that kind of a confined ministry. I say confined by reason of the fact that it's confined to the will of God. But that which is confined to God's will takes on enlargement in the purposes of God as He sends forth that word to bless His people. Confines us to Himself that the word might be pure and clean and that it might go forth to cleanse and to purify the hearts of his people. We're going to have a clear word going forth in the earth. In the midst of all the confusion, of all the strife of tongues, God in the age of apostasy has always been able to raise up a clear voice. In the age of apostasy, that encouraged me one time. He said, oh, for those days when the prophets spoke clearly, you read those prophets and you'll find that most of them God raised up in a time of great declension and apostasy. And God raised up a clear word in the earth. He sent it forth and he's going to do it again. He's going to send forth a clear word in this Laodicean age. In this age of much confusion and much strife of tongues, much arguing as to what the scriptures mean. God is going to speak by his spirit a clear word that God's people of ears to hear will know this is the voice of God. God will stand by it. May the Lord bless this for you.